This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a beautiful sunny day it is, though a little chilly. I'm glad to be with all of you, those who are joining us here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us over live stream. We are united in one Christ this morning, and I'm glad to be with all of you. I would invite you to take a moment to let us know that you're with us, to register your attendance. If you're in the sanctuary, those attendance pads are at the end of each row. If you'll sign in and uh, pass them down the row and back again. If you're visiting with us and would like to know a little bit more about our congregation and the ways that we're trying to live out God's love in the world, then uh, please share an email address or a phone number with us, and we will reach out and begin that conversation with you. If you're worshiping online, there should be a link in the chat that you can click on to register your attendance and let us know that you're with us as well. A few announcements this morning. Our building is pretty much dry. Yay! Wonderful news. A huge thanks to all of those professionals who were right on site when the pipe burst a week and a half ago, and uh, they really got the work done. There, um, the baseboards on the third floor are pulled out. It doesn't look pretty, but it's mostly usable. The fourth floor is not so much usable today, and children first through sixth grade will be gathering in the gymnasium downstairs. The younger children will be in their normal classrooms this morning. And th there are some other classes that may be affected, and hopefully you've been able to communicate amongst yourselves this morning. And the new member class will meet in McWhorter Hall as planned. There are some upcoming uh, opportunities to have conversations about our life together and our future together. Our leadership retreat is this Saturday from 8.45 to 11.30. If you are serving on a, one of the working committees of the church, you are invited. You don't have to be the chair of the committee, but if you're just serving on a committee. So hopefully you've already been contacted. You've got the link to sign up. Uh, we would love everyone to be there. And in addition to that, we are hosting our Project Thrive conversations uh, to dream about the future of the church, the long-term future of the church. There's information in the bulletin about when those are and how to sign up. We have a Zoom option as well as a couple of other in-person options. And believe it or not, Lent is around the corner. In just a couple of weeks, we will gather for, we are going to have our traditional pancake supper on Shrove Tuesday, March 1st, followed by Jazz Mass right here in the sanctuary that evening, and then Ash Wednesday worship on March 2nd, and then we begin the 40-day journey of Lent together. So I'm looking forward to that journey with you. But this morning, we continue to hear the voice of the Apostle Paul telling us what love is and what love does. This morning, he reminds us that love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. So let us raise our voices and hearts together as we rejoice in Christ's presence among us.
Let us rejoice with God, our Creator. Let us rejoice with Jesus, our Savior. Let us rejoice with the Holy Spirit, our Advocate. Jesus comes to proclaim peace to all who are far off and to all who are near. Through him, all of us have access in one spirit to God Almighty. Therefore, let us confess our sins together that we might receive forgiveness and peace. Loving God, our world seems such a mess right now. Greed triumphs over generosity. Death appears stronger than life. People judge one another harshly. Truth seems to be about who can yell the loudest. We fail to offer grace, and sin abounds. Forgive us, O oh God. Your love for us never ends. Your love for us does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Your mercy is for all of us. May we emulate your love each and every day. And now, O oh God, we offer you our individual confessions in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of reconciliation and love. If you're worshiping with us online this morning, you may do that by uh, putting something in the chat or uh, sharing peace with those that you're worshiping with. And those of you here in person, uh, welcome uh, each other with signs of love in whatever way is most comfortable to you. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. A lesson from the New Testament, Galatians 2, 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned, for until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate, separate for fear of circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cespis before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the gospel, the Gentiles, to live like the Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified, not by the works of the law, but through the faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ, so that we may be justified in faith and in Christ, and not by doing works of the law, because no one will be justified by works of the law. But if, in our efforts to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then the servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I have built up against the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For though the law, I died to the law, so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. 
and the life I now live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not nullify for the grace of God. For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of God for the people of God. Now I get to spend a special moment with our children, those who are here in the sanctuary. If you want to come join me up here, and if you're worshiping at home, just move a little closer to your screens and we'll wave to you. Someone sent me a picture this week of, of the two children in the house getting close to the screen right at this time, so I know that there are some at home. I'm always glad to see you. Come on up. Welcome, welcome. Great. Good to see everybody, and good to see you all, too, on the screens. Well, the, the weather is cold today, but it's starting to get a little warmer, and it starts making me think about summer, which starts making me think about ice cream. Who likes ice cream? I love ice cream. Coffee-flavored ice cream is my favorite, but that's probably not your favorite just yet. So I want you to imagine with me that I am standing with a friend of mine in line to get an ice cream cone. I'm ready with my cone, and my friend is in front of me in line, and she goes up and gets one scoop of ice cream. And then I go up, and I get two scoops of ice cream. <gasps> I don't know why. I didn't pay any more for it. I was just standing in line like her. Now, on the one hand, I could look at that, and I could dance around and celebrate because I got more than she did. But is that a very loving thing to do? Yeah. No, it's not, because I love my friend. So what I might do instead, because I love my friend, is to look at her and think, hmm, this doesn't feel right. Maybe I should share some of this extra scoop with her so that we both have the same. That's one way of loving. And that's one of the things that we hear in the Bible, that love doesn't celebrate and have a party when things are wrong or unfair. So we can practice that kind of love every day, can't we? Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for wonderful things in this world like ice cream. We thank you for the sun shining and the flowers that will be coming in just a few weeks. We thank you that you love us so much, that you love everyone so much, and that we get the chance to share that love with others. Help us to share your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. So if you're a three, four, or five, you can go with Pastor Maggie and Pastor Brandon to Children's Chapel. And if you are older than that, you can return to your seats with friends or family. So the Apostle Paul said, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. What is truth exactly? I think we live in an age, as probably in any age, when it's hard really to know sometimes what is true. Is truth based on numbers and statistics and data and facts? I have a, friend, a son, many of you know, Tate, who is a sophomore at Furman University, and he's taking statistics this semester. And, you know, the math gene doesn't run strong in the Dillon family, but he's doing pretty well, and he's actually found it really interesting. We were talking with him the other night about what was interesting in the class, and he said, we're learning about bias in numbers and how we can manipulate data or present numbers in a particular way to make the kind of point we're trying to make. As an example, he said, his professor told them that if you, if you study the numbers of graduates of the University of North Carolina, as much as it pains me to talk about the University of North Carolina as a Duke graduate, but if you look at the mean average of income earned by graduates, 
the major, the academic major that earns the most is geology. And the professor asked, now why would this be? So my first thought was maybe people who major in geology go into the oil industry, maybe? And that, the answer is, there was a graduate of the University of North Carolina who majored in geology whose name was Michael Jordan. So it's like one graduate in geology skewed all of the numbers. It's a, it's a mean average, which some of you who do math know what that means. But the point is that, that even with numbers and data, sometimes it's hard to know what's true. Or we can take an event that happens, and depending on who's reporting that event, we might get very different interpretations and opinions about what happened or what the event was all about. So it's hard to know what, what is truth. And for us who follow Jesus, who are members of the household of God, what do we mean when we say truth? Jesus talked a lot about truth. In fact, Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which makes me think that for us, truth is not so much about numbers and facts and data as it is about a person, as it is about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul talks about truth. Love rejoices in the truth. What did he mean by truth? Well, in order to get into that a little bit, I want to invite us into this episode he recounts in the second chapter of Galatians. Now, it's a complicated text, and it's hard to pull it out of context without knowing what all was going on, so let me set the stage for us a little bit. Paul is very clear in this text that what he believes that is the truth of the gospel, he is concerned with the truth of the gospel, which is that Christ lived and died and was resurrected for all people, that through the grace of God made known to us in Jesus Christ, we are all one. God's grace has been poured out unconditionally upon everyone. And so in other places in his writings, he says, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, enslaved or free, male and female. All these distinctions we make in our world don't matter in Christ. We are all one. In another place, he talks about Christ has torn down the dividing walls between us so that we are all one in Christ. Peter believed that too in the truth of the gospel. Now, Peter, like Paul, had been raised as a Jew. He had practiced all of his life the, the Jewish laws of eating clean foods and avoiding unclean foods. As a Jew, he could sit at a table with others who were eating clean foods, eating kosher, but he was not to share table fellowship with Gentiles or with those who were not eating clean foods. That was just the practice. That's the way it was. But early in his ministry, after Jesus' resurrection, as Peter becomes a leader of the church, he's given a vision by the Holy Spirit. And we hear about it in Acts 10 and 11, where God places before Peter in this vision all the animals of the earth. And a voice says to Peter, they are all clean, Peter. What I have declared clean, you shall not declare unclean. And it's obvious that this voice of God is not just talking about animals and food, but about people. Because the Spirit then sends Peter to the home of a Roman centurion where Peter preaches the gospel and the centurion and all of his household believe and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And Peter sees with his own eyes that in Christ there is no distinction. And he stays with Cornelius and he eats with him and shares table fellowship in a radically new way. So now we fast forward a few years and we get to this episode that we've just heard about in Galatians. There's a large group of Christians gathered in Antioch together. There must be Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians coming from different backgrounds. And Paul looks over and sees that Peter is refusing to sit with the Gentiles. He is once again pulled back from table fellowship with Gentile Christians. And Paul believes in this action that the truth of the gospel is at stake 
that Peter is not living out the truth of the gospel, that they're all one in Christ Jesus. And so he stands up, and as he tells us, I confronted Peter to his face in front of everyone and told him that he was not acting in a way that was consistent with the truth of the gospel, that he was rebuilding walls that Christ had torn down. Now, I don't know that Paul was very gentle about that. I don't know the tone of voice that Paul took with Peter. I think maybe he could have pulled Peter out of the room and maybe had a private conversation. But then again, maybe he needed to confront Peter in front of everyone so that those Gentiles who were being uh, treated as less than could hear someone in the church stand up and say, this is wrong. We are all one. Paul and Peter in this moment. Paul is holding Peter accountable in love to love. I think it's something that we can learn from as a fellowship of believers together. There is a time when we need to hold one another accountable to love, to do that in love with kindness and gentleness, but to be able to say to one another, I believe the actions that you're cha- taking or the choices that you're making are not consistent with the truth of the gospel, that God came, God's grace is for all people, that there should be no distinctions between us. I know the times in my life when I've had a friend or another member of the church hold me accountable in a loving way. It may be hard in the moment, but boy, am I grateful for it. Because we know the agape love that that we are called to live into. And sometimes we need one another to be reminded of that. If we go back to this phrase in 1 Corinthians 13, it sheds even more light on this episode between Peter and Paul. Paul had said, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. The best translation for wrongdoing is unjustness, injustice. For someone being wronged or treated differently or made to feel less than, discriminated against. Rejoicing in the truth of the gospel that all people are poor, are receivers of grace through Jesus Christ. That all people are children of God created in the image of God. And so here we see Paul living that love out. Not rejoicing in the unfair way his Gentile friends are being treated and holding Peter to a standard of the truth of the gospel. Now, I don't know what happened between Peter and Paul after this. The book of Acts or any of the letters of Paul don't don't tell us where their friendship ended. But church tradition says that at the end of their lives, they both ended up in Rome. They were both martyred in Rome. We know that Paul was under house arrest at the end of the book of Acts. So in our Bible study this week, we we imagined, what if Peter and Paul got together in Rome, sat at a little cafe table sipping espresso, and reflected together about the amazing ways the Holy Spirit had worked through them throughout their ministries, and talked about this moment of confrontation. I'd like to think that Peter reached over and grabbed Paul's hand and said, thank you, my brother. Thank you for reminding me of the love and grace of God. May we all rejoice in the truth of the gospel. Amen. truth of the gospel is by proclaiming our beliefs together. So if you can stand in body or spirit, turn to page 883 in your hymnal and you'll find the statement of faith from the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating 
who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, I invite you to lift up both your spoken and your silent prayer requests. If you'd like to share them with the pastoral team to pray throughout the week, you can fill out a card in the pew rack in front of you and put that in the offering bins in the Narthex and in Reed Hall. If you're online, you can click the Contact Us link on our website and fill out the prayer request there. Today we rejoice um, with the Counts family. Sebastian James Counts was born January the 27th to Kayla and Donald Counts. He is welcomed also by his big brother, Tristan. And our deepest sympathy is extended to Pam and Wendell Barnett and their family. They are mourning the death of Pam's father, Reverend Vernon Burrow, who passed away on February the 7th. Memorial services will be held at a later date. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you this morning grateful for the love we have because you first loved us. All we know from love is from you since you created us from love. We give you thanks for the ways in which your love is known to us through the scripture, through one another, through worship. Your love is a gift beyond what we could ask or imagine. Thank you. On this weekend that celebrates romantic love, we pray for those who are lonely and longing for someone to fully know and love them. We pray for those who grieve the loss of their loved one. We ask for your presence to be felt to those who have been harmed by someone they love. We pray for those who have not found healthy ways to love themselves. Help us to be a people of love and truth. Help us to break down barriers that divide people and build bridges of extravagant love that others may know your love for us. Bring us to places of hope and compassion, offering to build rather than demolish, offering to listen rather than pronounce our own ideas. Remind us that you are the God of all people, seeking hope and healing for each one. For it is in this extravagant love that we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to a time of offering, we recognize that everyone's in a different position financially, so we hope that you will give as you are able for those worshiping with us online, you can see the options on your screen. For those in the narthex, in the sanctuary, you can put your uh, offering in the bins in the narthex and in Reed Hall. Let us offer our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, and our hearts to God who loves us unconditionally.
from this time together rejoicing at the truth of the gospel, rejoicing in the immeasurable, universal love of God that leaves no one out. May we rejoice in that love that is for us, that is for all. And may that joy spread that love wherever we go. Amen.